I just want to state up front, I'm not one of those who believes that you only use the King James. There are some people like that, and I use a lot of these arguments, and I don't agree with a lot of the arguments they use. A lot of the conspiracy theories they come up with are not true, and unfortunately, because of that, they actually make their argument worse than it is, because there is, as I've gone into it, a very good case for some of the scriptures that are in versions like the King James and the New King James that aren't in the newer versions. There's good arguments in their favor. Unfortunately, they cloud the issue by coming up with a lot of crazy conspiracy theories at times. And uh, I'm going to dismiss those and I want to go into the actual facts. So we're going to be looking at the source texts for the New Testament. I'm going to have to go at quite a pace. So if you don't get everything, the information will be on the website. A lot of the time, I'm just going to give a summary of the particular slide, and if you want the detail, you have to go get it later. The original writings of the New Testament, what we call the autographs, were written between 50 and 100 AD, all in the first century, and they were written in Koine Greek, that's the common Greek. It was the trade language of the Eastern Mediterranean in Jesus' day, pretty much like English is a trade language today, so Koine Greek was in those days. The original letters were written on papyrus, and obviously we don't have those anymore. Papyrus is not very durable, especially in poor climates. But there were plenty of copies made of these documents, which we call manuscripts. And when we talk about New Testament textual criticism, we're talking mainly about Greek manuscripts, because the original books were written in Greek. Please note that when we say textual criticism, that doesn't mean we're criticizing them. In the same way, when you talk about apologetics, it doesn't mean you're apologizing. Textual criticism just means examining the different documents and deciding what was part of the original text. Now, manuscripts are divided into four groupings, uh, papyri, the unseals, minuscules, and lectionaries. Okay, the earliest witnesses to the original texts are on papyrus. And amazingly, we still have some of these you know, left. Over 140 have been found. And these date from sometime in the third century. We've even got some fragments which are from the second century. So you don't get the complete Bible, but we've got a lot of fragmentary evidence to the New Testament writings. Then the unseals. They are sections of the New Testament in either Greek or Latin. They're written on vellum or parchment, which is a lot more durable. And this was commonly used from the 4th to the 8th centuries AD. Now, unseal basically means it's all in capitals. This will give you new respect for some of the translators. Is There's no punctuation and often no word separation. And there's just an example I've given you with English that the columns were kept straight by simply continuing the word on the next line. I put the alternate words in red there. But over there, if you came to the end of the line, you hadn't finished the word, you just carried on. And when they talk about a codex, all it means is an early form of a book, which was developed around 50 to 280. So whenever they talk about unsealed codex, it means a codex that is written in that format. Then you get the minuscules, which are very pretty if you look at them. It's a small cursive Greek text, and those are later than the unseals. They are also written on parchment. After the 12th century, they started using paper, and we have about 2,800 of those. But they date from about the 800 to the 1500s. Lectionaries, we have 2,200 of these. These are portions of scripture that were copied out to read in a church service. And so often you have the preacher's notes in there as well, along with the scripture. So these are very informative documents. Now, the New Testament has been pre preserved in more manuscripts than any other ancient work of literature. So we have over 5,800 complete or fragmented Greek manuscript. There's no other document that can make that claim. We have 10,000 Latin manuscripts. And the dates of these manuscripts range from around 125 AD. That is the Papyrus 52, which is the oldest copy of John. Amazing. If you think that John only wrote about AD 100, and we have a document from one to five, literally 25 years after when he wrote of portions of what he wrote. 
We also have the benefit that the New Testament was translated into different languages very early on. And so we have 9,300 manuscripts in other languages from very early days, including Syriac, Slavic, Gothic, Ethiopic, Coptic, which is what they spoke in Egypt, and Armenian. And then on top of that, the New Testament was quoted by the church fathers, who are leaders of the church who wrote from the end of the first century, the second century, the third century. So it's been said, I don't know how true it is, that even if we didn't have any of the manuscripts, we could recompile the New Testament just from the quotes from the church fathers. So this is wonderful. It's a good thing because it means we can cross-check all these unseals, the papyrus, the translations, the church fathers. So when there's ever dispute about a particular rendering, we've got lots of witnesses. There's nothing bad about it. It's good. And so here's a very quick timeline that I drew up. So here we have the original Greek writings in the first century. We have the Syriac. So this is a translation. It's called the Peshitta in the second century AD. We have Coptic translations from the second century. Remember Coptic, they spoke in Egypt and from the fourth century. We have Latin translations because obviously the Romans spoke Latin, so it was very important to get the Bible in Latin. Then we have the Latin Vulgate, which is the famous translation by Jerome, which became the standard Bible of the church for over a thousand years. Then we have a lot of texts, and we're going to group them into texts called the minority texts and the majority texts. Now, the minority texts, these are Greek copies that were made of the scriptures. And we have the Alexandrian texts. We're going to learn about this later. From the fourth century AD, we already have these copies. Then we have the majority text family. Now, there's a big debate between minority texts and majority texts. And sometimes when different Bibles have slightly different renderings, it's because some of them are using the minority text, others are using the majority text. Okay, and that's what we call the Byzantine text. Then we have an Armenian translation from the fifth century and a Georgian one from the sixth century, and I left it off there. I dealt mainly with the earlier ones. So let's look at this big debate about the majority text and the minority text. A lot of guys come up with a whole lot of conspiracies as well. Some of them true, some of them not so true. So there's three major Greek New Testament traditions. There's the Alexandrian text type. Remember, Alexandria is in Egypt. The Byzantine text type. Byzantine, Byzantium was the old name for Constantinople. So when we're talking about that, we're talking about the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. And then we have the Western text type. That was we found in the Western Roman Empire before Latin took over, because these are all Greek translations. The Western text, we're not going to talk too much about it. The reason why it's not considered too important because they used a lot of paraphrase. So often, they were, uh, just as today we have paraphrases, but when we want to go back to the original, what Paul wrote, we're not too interested in people who expand the text. And the Western uh, text tends to expand a lot, and it's considered a paraphrase, so generally it's ignored. And the two ones we're going to look at a lot are the Alexandrian and the Byzantine. Now, if you look at this, you'll see that the Alexandrian are older. So there, when you see already from the second century, we have Alexandrian texts. They're the most ancient. The Western texts, you can see where they fit in there. We don't have as many, but we're not going to worry too much about them. The Byzantine, slightly later, but there are plenty more of them. And... That's why that is called the majority text. In fact, 80% of the manuscripts we have, over 5,000, are the Byzantine text, and that's why it's referred to as the majority text. But they're not the oldest. So we get this argument going on because the Byzantine constitute the majority. The Alexandrian are older, the ones that we have anyway, but they minority, the minority text. Now, you'll also find particular people who you know, advocate what they call King James only, where they believe that's the only Bible English people should use. They'll talk about the Textus Receptus. Now, the Textus Receptus 
is similar to the majority texts. It's not exactly the same. There are some differences, but not a lot. So Textus Receptus, which was used for the King James, similar to the Byzantine and the majority, not the same. Most of the new Bibles use the Alexandrian. There, for your reference, are some notable Byzantine manuscripts. You can see all the way back from the fifth century. The Codex Alexandrinus. Now, the Alexandrian text, as I said, the smallest amount, we've got about around 45 manuscripts, minority text, but the oldest. And we have them up until about the ninth century, and then they tend to disappear. Now, when you think about it, where do people translate the Bible from? Some people have an idea you've just got this Greek text and people translate it from. Well, those Greek texts are compiled by scholars and they're called eclectic Greek editions. In other words, they're not just taking just a single document because they don't always have that. They take in a whole lot of different documents and they compile in a text and that text is used as the source for the translation. Here are some notable Alexandrian manuscripts. You can see all the way back to the third century. So going back to that diagram, just to give you a bit of clarity on here. So yeah, we have the Alexandrian. Obviously, they would have originated from Egypt. The Byzantine would have predominantly come from the area that was ruled by Constantinople. And the Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox, obviously continued that uh, tradition because they spoke Greek. And so they kept the Greek scriptures. And that's why we call the majority text the Byzantine. There's also a strong document tradition of Latin because the Catholic Church ultimately adopted Latin as the language and then they started keeping in the West where the, the capital was Rome, they started keeping the scriptures in Latin, in particular the, the Vulgate. Okay, now since the fourth century, the church in Europe was divided between the Latin speaking West. So in the West, they spoke mainly Latin, and there you can see Rome dominated. In the East, you had Constantinople, remember, it used to be Byzantium, and that's why it's often referred to as the Byzantine Empire. And this is where we get the Byzantine texts coming from, the majority texts. And because the Western church changed its preferred language from Greek to Latin, thereafter the manuscript tradition was Latin. They copied the scriptures in Latin. And we've got a lot of Latin documents. But the Eastern Church, which was centered in Constantinople, continued using Greek as its primary language for additional 1,000 years. So while the Catholic Church was keeping the scriptures in Latin, the Orthodox Church still had it in Greek, which was the original language that it was written in. The Latin was a translation. So it stands to reason that more Greek manuscripts have been discovered in Eastern Europe than in Western Europe. What happened, though, in the 15th century, Constantinople, which was this really famous city, it was much larger than Rome at that time, and it, um, the Eastern Roman Empire survived the Western Roman Empire by, by a thousand years, eventually it fell to the Muslims. The Turks conquered it, and they've subsequently renamed it in the 20th century to Istanbul, and it was a great center of Christianity. But what happened is a lot of the Christian Orthodox scholars fled to Western Europe. And like any good scholars, they took their documents with them. And so you had this big influx into Western Europe of these Greek scriptures. And so scholars compared them and they noticed there were some differences that this Latin tradition had deviated a bit. Yeah, you got the Greek, which they assumed was truer because it was originally written in Greek and they compared it to the Latin scriptures and there were sometimes differences. And so there was a Dutch Catholic scholar named Erasmus and he decided to compile a Greek New Testament using the Greek scriptures that were available then. 
And so he compiled a Greek text of the New Testament and he used seven Greek manuscripts. But they were all dated from the 12th century or later because that's all he had. But bearing in mind at that stage, it was a milestone. They would only had Latin. Now all of a sudden they've got all these Greek manuscripts coming in. He takes seven of them and he translates a text. And that text was put to good use because Martin Luther used that text to translate the Bible into German, uh, the New Testament. And that was the same text that William Tyndall used when he translated the Bible into English. They used Erasmus's text. That text was the same that ultimately was the foundation of the King James Version as well. But I just want to point out to the King James only guys, they'll, they'll talk about the textus receptus, the received text, and they use that term. It's actually a bit of a misnomer because that wasn't the text that was originally called the Textus Receptus. Because you see there, I've done a little diagram, Erasmus's third edition was used by a guy called Estian, and then that was used by Theodore Beezer, who was Calvin, John Calvin's successor. And when I say used, it means they adapted it, made changes. And Beezer, subsequently, that document was used by Elzevar, and that is the one where the term Textus Receptus came from. So it actually had nothing to do with the KJV. But nowadays, people refer to this whole family as the Textus Receptus, the received text. And they use it in the sense that it was almost like God from heaven gave this text to Erasmus, which wasn't quite the case. Okay. But originally, it just referred to that. But there you can see that the KJV came from this family, which came from the Greek text produced by Erasmus. Now, the great unsealed codices. Remember, codice is a book. Unseal, all in capitals, no punctuation. They found the, a lot of these codices later after Erasmus had done his work. And these are the ones that some of them have got the Alexandrian text, which is older. So the three most famous ones is Codex Sinaiaticus, dated from about 300 to 360, very ancient. And that's Alexandrian text. And the beauty of these is that they almost a the complete Bible. They also had the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint. Remember the Septuagint was a translation of the Hebrew text. So they had the Greek Old Testament, plus they had the New Testament, but slight differences to the Byzantine. Then there's the Codex Vaticanus, also found subsequent to Erasmus's work, also very ancient, also Alexandrian text. Codex Alexandrinus, this one's a bit unusual in that the Gospels are actually Byzantine text, whereas the rest is Alexandrian, but very ancient as well. Two other important ones, they're not complete Bibles, the other ones are almost complete, are the Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus, that's also a mixture, as you can see there, of the Byzantine and Alexandrian. So sometimes you've got mixtures. And then the other one is the Codex Biza, which is Western text. Remember I told you Western text is the one that used a lot of paraphrase. This particular one actually has the four Gospels. And on the one side, it's got them in Greek and in Latin. So it's very useful because you can actually see the Greek and the Latin. Now, the Greek and New Testament was copied hand copied. They didn't have computers, they didn't have printing presses, so as careful as they were, occasionally scribes would make mistakes. And a lot of the mistakes are really inconsequential. They variance in spelling. They're not changing any major do doctrine. But obviously, if there was an error and it wasn't noticed, if a person copied from that document, that error carried through. And so you'd get a line of texts where you'd have these differences. And so textual criticism is where they examine all available manuscripts and they compare and they try to determine what the original text was, which effectively is what Erasmus did. The only difference is he only had seven texts. Now we've got thousands. And so in the 19th century, there were these guys called Westcott and Hort. They worked for 28 years on the text, but they started using these older texts, the Alexandrian ones, and they favored those. In fact, in particular, they favored two old manuscripts, the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Remember, I mentioned them, those unsealed codices, very ancient ones, and those were their favored ones. 
They also like the Codex Beza, even though that's the Western text. And they had a strange idea that shorter is better. So they use the Alexandrian text, which is generally shorter. Often there's, you know, verses that aren't in there or aren't as long as the Byzantine text. And they said, well, that's better. They said that scribes were more likely to add than to delete. And in certain cases, the Codex Beza, even though it uses paraphrases because it's Western text, had missing verses. And then I would say, well, that's more likely the original. So in certain cases, they actually used the Codex Beza. And this text, Greek text that they came up uh, with was used for the English Revised Version and the American Standard Version in 1901. That's not the text that's used today predominantly. Because subsequently, there were even more documents discovered. And there was a man called Eberhard Nestle, and he put together a Greek New Testament as well. The work has been subsequently carried on. It was carried on by his son, along with Kurt and Barbara Allen. And so when they talk about the Nestle Allen, they're talking about the text. It's not the same as the Westcott Hort, but um, it's very similar. And that's what most English Bibles used today. And it's very close to the Alexandrian. They tried to eliminate some of the extremes of a guy called Tischendorf because he favored Sinaiticus because he discovered it. And Westcott Hort favored the Vaticanus, both very ancient Alexandrian texts. There's also what's called the United Bible Societies text, but that is the same as the Nestle Allen. It's just a different name. So if you see in your Bible that it's used the Nestle Allen or the, or the UBS, it's the same thing. Okay, it's identical. Some minor punctuation differences. Most modern Bibles use the Nestle Allen and the UBS. So eclectic text, all that means is that it's not a particular document they translate in. They've got a thousands of documents and they compile in like Erasmus did, except they've got a lot more texts and they compile in these texts. So when they talk about the critical text, that is the text that is used in most modern Bibles and it has an Alexandrian flavor to it because they favor the older Alexandrian texts. You'll find that Bibles like the KJV and the NKJV follow the Byzantine more. So there's three major texts you can choose to use. There's the Textus Receptus, which is what Erasmus did, similar to but not identical to the majority text. There are some differences. The critical text uses the older readings, the Alexandrian ones. And they say the shorter, the better. They say if something's shorter, well, that was probably the original reading and someone added that other stuff in afterwards rather than someone left it out. The majority text says well, the original is more likely to be the one where we have the most. So you could call it the democratic method. Each t a manuscript gets a vote and they say, well, because over 80% of the texts follow the, uh, the Byzantine, that's the better, uh, better text. And so that the KJV and the NKJV are using the better text. It's a big debate. Okay, so here's a quick timeline. The Textus Receptus of Greek texts was put together by Erasmus. And it has a Byzantine flavor because he used Byzantine texts. Then we have a guy called Tischendorf um, who discovered Sinaiticus and he put a text together as well, Alexandrian in flavor. Then we had Westcott and Hort, who though they consulted different documents, primarily favored Vaticanus, also Alexandrian. This is the one, as I say, is the basis of most English Bibles, modern ones, the UBS or the Nestle Allen, Alexandrian flavor. So you can see the whole swing of the modern scholar, uh, scholarship to favor Alexandrian texts. But there are others who, who disagree and say that the Byzantine is better. And so in 1982, uh, Hodges and Fast had uh, put together what they call the majority text. So similar to Erasmus, except they had thousands of documents, but they favored the Byzantine text. And that would be the one that the New King James Version uses. And he has another majority text that's been put together by Robinson and Pierpont. So there's this debate. The majority of scholars favor Alexandrian. And so there's a document you can refer to, 
The Tyndale Bible, remember, would have used the Textus Receptus that Erasmus put together. So would have the King James. And all the Bibles of that era, of the, uh, the Reformation, used the Textus Receptus, Byzantine in flavor, similar to the majority, not identical. Uh, the Darby Rames Bible, which came out at that time, a Catholic Bible, was translated from the Latin. Okay, there in red, I've put all the ones that use the Alexandrian texts. So you see the earliest uh, ones used Westcott and Hort, but the later ones, so when you have your uh, Niv Bible and your NASB and your New Living Translation, they're all using the Nestle Allen. If you prefer the majority text, the, and you like something that's more modern than the, the King James in terms of reading, the New King James Version uses the majority text. The World English Bible, it's only available online. It also uses the majority text as well. Both very good Bibles. Okay, so let's look at some variances between the majority text and the minority text because sometimes you're going to come across people who bring these variances up. One of the most notable things about the Alexandrian, as I said, is that there's slightly few verses. It's slightly shorter. And so the attitude of modern scholars is, well, the shorter must have been the original, and people added stuff in afterwards. Those who um, favor the Byzantines say, well, the longer was actually the original, and they must have been deleted in the Alexandrian text because they believe that people are more likely to delete because a deletion can be, a, can be a mistake. You can accidentally not put a verse in, but to go actually write in a verse that's not there, that seems, you know, something not many people would do to go just make up a verse and put it in the Bible. You can imagine someone accidentally leaving a verse out, but you can't accidentally put a verse in. Now, I tend to agree with them. Now, the majority of these differences are insignificant or immaterial. So there's some people who make a big deal about them and they say these other Bibles are corrupted and it's a Catholic conspiracy and it's of the devil. And to be honest, most of the differences are insignificant, but there are some that are important and those are the ones I wanna to touch on at quite a speed. Okay, so remember the Alexandrian texts they favor in particular the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus codexes because they're very ancient. Both of them don't have the ending of Mark. So Mark 16, 9 to 20, you will find are not in those ancient manuscripts. But that longer ending is found in more than 99% of the Byzantine manuscripts. It's preserved in the 5th century Codex Alexandrinus. Remember I told you that's the one that's still got the Byzantine renderings in the Gospels. And I've listed at the bottom, we don't have time, all the different Greek unseals where you'll find it included or not. So the New King James, the King James, and the World English Bible, because they're based on the Textus Receptus, the majority texts, all have the ending of Mark in there. That's the part where it's a variant of the Great Commission, but in particular where it talks about Jesus says you'll pick up you know, serpents and things like that. And some people say, well, that shouldn't have never been in there. It was added. Now, most of the modern Bibles actually do have it in, but what they'll do is they'll either bracket it or they'll put a footnote or they'll put something before and they'll say this is not in a lot of the manuscripts. And some people don't like it because they say, well, it's putting it into question. But I mean, they're just saying, you know, stating the facts. It isn't in some of the, the manuscripts. So was the long ending in the original gospel? Those who like the Alexandrian text will say, no, it wasn't. Someone added it in afterwards just to, because they thought the gospel ended abruptly and they put that ending in there. I want to point out to you that even though Codex Vaticanus doesn't contain it, the scribes seem to have known about it because he left space for it. So it's, people say, well, it's not in Codex Vaticanus. Well, there's a space vacant there. This is where the testimony, remember I told you about the early church fathers, is important. 
my good friend Irenaeus, remember, lived in the second century, second generation disciple of John. He quotes from every New Testament book except Philemon and 3 John. Now, the interesting thing is he lived 200 years before the earliest Alexandrian texts. So people say, well, we've got these texts from the fourth century and we trust them because they're oldest. Well, Irenaeus is older because he's from the second century, but he quoted that passage, Mark. So if you want to follow the rule, oldest equals best, we've got a second century quotation from a very reliable church father who quoted it. Tatian was a, a guy who actually compiled a document where he tried to harmonize the four Gospels into one. And in his harmonization, he included the text from Mark 16 in the second century. So to try to go with the argument, well, it was put in later. Well, how come do we have people quoting it in the second century? Okay, here we've got translations where you find it in. Okay, here's another famous one. Because this is a very important uh, account. This is the account where Jesus forgives the adulteress. So not only does it teach, you know, the forgiveness of Jesus, we see how it extends grace uh, to this woman. But that passage is not in a lot of the Alexandrian documents. There are 1,495 Greek manuscripts included, but there's 267 which don't. So the majority included. Again, you'll find it in the KJV, NKJV, same story. And again, you'll find it in all the new Bibles as well, but it will be bracketed or footnoted, and they'll say some manuscripts don't have this. 17 of the 23 old Latin manuscripts contain at least part of it. But although it's not found in the two earliest surviving Greek Gospels, nor in the two earliest Greek Bibles, in four of those manuscripts, they might acknowledge the existence via certain marks that they put. I'll show you an example later on where they'd put marks to indicate that there was text that may or may not be in there. So they were aware of it, it appears. And so the UBS um, writings and uh, Bruce Metzger, when they list codices L and Delta, and they say it's witnesses against it because they don't have it, they don't mention that there's actually a vacant space in both of those manuscripts after John 7, uh, 52, proving that the scribes knew there was something they were leaving out because they left a space after it. Okay, there, the Syriac contains it in second century. It was claimed that no Greek church father mentioned the passage, but we've recently found writings by a guy called Didymus the Blind, who lived in the fourth century, and he clearly refers to the passage. We've, uh, there again, some church fathers who quote it. Jerome not only referred to it, but he included it in the Vulgate, which means he accepted it as, as genuine. So when he put together the Latin Vulgate, it includes that passage it was quoted by Leo the Great in one of his sermons. And I don't have time to mention them all. There's a whole lot of other guys who quote it. Augustine, very important church father, actually writes that the passage was deliberately removed from some uh, manuscripts because people wanted to avoid the impression that Christ had sanctioned adultery. And so there's, there's the actual quote where Augustine was aware that some documents, manuscripts at that time had taken it out because of the fact they had a problem with it. Not so much for the uh, forgiveness, but Jesus is forgiving an adulterer. I thought he was giving people permission to sin. And again, I don't have a lot of time for this, but a lot of the arguments people mention, you'll find that they sometimes are a bit selective you know, with the evidence. We find that it's included in the, the Coptic versions, the Palestinian Syriac, the Georgian, and others as well. 
Now, there's several Armenian manuscripts that retain the passage, although it's left out of others, and it's placed at the end of John's gospel. So some people get a bit alarmed because they read the footnote there and they say sometimes it's put at the end of the gospel. But we have a guy called Nikon in the 10th century who said the Armenians took it out of their text because it seemed to teach leniency towards adultery. So this to me seems to favor the fact what the people who prefer the majority text saying that it's more likely for people to take something out or to accidentally leave it out than it is for people to put stuff in, which is what the modern theory is, is that the shorter is the better. Yes, some will, will say that if you remove the passage, it's more logical, but others say the opposite is true. So those kind of arguments are really pretty silly. The weight of evidence points, I believe, to have been written by John and been in the proper place. There's nothing strange about the passage. The teaching of Jesus forgiving bad sinners is not unique. He forgave Zacchaeus. He forgave Matthew as a tax collector. He was criticized for hanging around with sinners and prostitutes, tax collectors. Now there's it unique in showing that Jesus showed compassion and defended sinful women. He did so for Mary Magdalene. He did so to the Samaritan woman who had you know, been married multiple times and to the sinful woman who anointed his feet. Something Jesus did. It's not out of character. And the message of Jesus reinterpreting the law of Moses in the light of the new covenant is exactly what Jesus repeatedly did in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, it was written, but I say, it was written. And that's what they said to him. They said, you know, according to the law, Moses told us to stone such a woman. What do you say? Nothing inconsistent about it. Now, I have to pick up the pace. Luke 4, verse 44. This is a minor difference. In the KJV, it will say that Jesus preached in the synagogues of Galilee. In the ESV, which is based on the, the Alexandrian, and most of the Bibles, English Bibles, will say he preached in the synagogues of Judea. That's a bit of a difference because Galilee is in the north, Judea is in the south. So where was Jesus? Was he in Galilee or in Judea? Now, interestingly, some of the newer Bibles on that verse follow the majority text. So the HCSB and the ISV, which normally use the UBS, follow the majority text there. Why? Because if you look at the context, it actually shows that Jesus is in Galilee. So I think the King James and the New King James have got the better reading there because else you suddenly have in the next verse where he's, you know, moved from Galilee to Judea. So... Again, not really a big deal for some people, but I believe that that's the correct rendering. The other thing is, there's very little evidence that there were synagogues in Judea. Why? Because they had the temple. And the synagogue was kind of almost like, not a replacement, but if it was too far to go to the temple, they had synagogues. And so I've given a quote there at the bottom of guys have done research there. We don't actually have archaeological evidence of of synagogues in Judea in Jesus' time. The synagogues were in Galilee. So it shows that I believe that the, the majority text is correct on that particular one, even though it's a, a minor difference. Yes, one that's fairly significant as well. This verse is left out of the modern versions, and it's normally footnoted. It's not even put in the text. Okay, and that's the part where Philip is with the Ethiopian eunuch, and then the eunuch says, well, there's water. What stops me from being baptized? In the King James and the New King James, it says that Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You'll find that's not in uh, the newer Bibles except in the footnote. The Vulgate includes it. It's absent from many of the oldest Greek manuscripts. So the same old story. And I'm going to move at a pace here. But again, let me go back to my friend Irenaeus. He lived in the second century. His writings predate the same Greek manuscripts that omit this verse, and yet he referred to it. Another early church reader, Cyprian, also cites that verse, and you can see he lived from 200 to 258. So if it wasn't in the original, and it's missing in fourth century documents, how is it that people in the second century are quoting it? There's a whole lot of other church fathers who quote it.
So maybe the verse wasn't added. Maybe it was deleted. Maybe it was accidentally deleted. There's some people who've proposed that maybe it was deliberately deleted because at that time they'd started to believe that baptism shouldn't immediately follow conversion. And that's actually what's happening there. Uh, when he says, what hinders me from being baptized? He said, well, if you believe, you know, you can. He's literally just become a Christian. And some people at that time didn't think that that was correct. You had to, yeah, in fact, a lot of them got baptized right, you know, before they died. It's a, poss uh, it's a possibility. Okay. More powerful demons are more difficult to exercise. The Bible's clear on that. But when the disciples asked Jesus why they couldn't drive the demon out of the boy, you'll find that in the King James and the New King James, he says, this kind can come out by nothing except by prayer and fasting. The and fasting, if you've got a new version, is not there. Now, it's fairly significant because if you're involved in driving out demons, are you supposed to fast now or not? Um, or should you just pray? Again, you'll find it's mainly due to Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, and the Uncial 0274 omitted these ancient Alexandrian documents. So was it there? Well, there's a parallel verse in Matthew 17 verse 21. It says, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. We have an extremely ancient witness to this from a guy called Clement of Rome who actually lived in the first century, and he quoted the passage. It's alluded to by Tertullian. The Latin translation by Jerome includes it. He translated from the Greek, the Greek manuscripts he had added in. So those who say it's inserted will say, well, you know, they were emphasizing fasting in the early church, and that's why they decided to add it, which means people were tampering with the word of God and just adding stuff in. Those who say it was deleted say, well, either it was accidental or maybe it was deliberate because there were some groups in the church who opposed fasting because there were some heretical groups that overemphasized fasting and punishing the flesh. Matthew 24, verse 36. Of that day and hour knoweth no man, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only, it says in the KJV. In the modern versions, it says, nor the Son. Now, the Alexandrian text has a higher proportion of difficult readings. And they say, well, that's good, because if it's difficult, that was the original. Uh, the original must have been difficult. And then they say that the later guys, because it was difficult, they took it out. Because it's implying that Jesus lacked full divine foreknowledge. That's no theological difficulty. The Bible makes it clear that Christ was limited as a man. So the fact that it says, nor the son there, isn't really an issue. Jesus, as a man, got tired, hungry, and thirsty, and he succumbed to death, things that, as God, you know, he would not do. But what kind of blows it out of the water is we go to the peril verse in Mark, both the Alexandrian and the Byzantine have nor the son in. So the argument falls flat because... Alexandrian and Byzantine, if you go to the other gospel, say nor the sun. So nor the sun was part of the original. In the critical text, they don't have the verse where Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. That's very important. Okay. It's interesting though, that the one part that's missing is where Jesus forgives the adulterer. And here's another one, which some people have a problem theologically, because they say, yeah, Jesus is forgiving people who didn't ask for forgiveness. Now, you'll find that newer Bibles all put it in, but they'll footnote it. You might not have noticed, but it's footnoted. That, but that is a very important difference. But there's overwhelming patristic evidence. When I say patristic, I'm talking about the church fathers. I put it at the bottom there. You won't believe the amount of church fathers that quoted that. So we've got an extremely strong case that that was in the original because guys were quoting it from the very beginning. It's a very theological, theologically significant verse. Here's another one. It's probably, uh, theologically maybe not as important, but when it talks about Jesus sweating great drops of blood falling to the ground, it's not in a lot of the Alexandrian and it was 
either be left out or footnoted in some of the modern Bibles. But again, we have early second century writers like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Hippolytus quoting it. Romans 8 verse 1, that part there, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, you'll see it in the King James, you won't see it in the newer ones. That to me is not as significant because you'll find that exact same phrase is then used later on. So all that happens is in the King James, you have it twice. In the modern ones, you only have it once. So it's less of an issue. There's another one that you'll find in the King James and New King James. Where it talks about an angel going down and troubling the water. And that's explaining why the man, the first one in would be healed. It is not in many of the Alexandrian. It's excluded, normally footnoted in the newer versions. I won't go into all the debate because my time is short. So you'll see from what I presented so far on the important differences. So, so there's lots of differences. Most of them aren't important. Those ones I've mentioned, I think, are pretty, you know, pretty important. There are cases where the Textus Receptus, remember the one that was used for the King James, and the majority text differ. Not many, very few. And in this case, there's a stronger argument to say that maybe they shouldn't be there. Although, again, there's cases for both. So I just want to mention important ones. The one is what they call the comma Johannem. 1 John 5, verse 7 to 8. The part that I've got in green, which I'll read, is in the KJV and the New King James, but it's not in the newer ones. In fact, you'll find an abbreviated version, and I won't read that there, but it misses out that in green. So this is what it says in the KJV. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree in one. That green part, not in the majority text as well. Now, even if it wasn't in the original, it doesn't mean that what it says is not true. You are not destroying arguments for the Trinity by not having that verse. I want to tell you, I can give you 20 other uh, scriptures that come from Alexandrian texts as well, which prove, I mean, just take John 1 verse 1 is the most famous one. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, you know, teaching the deity of Jesus. So, that is actually only found in eight late Greek manuscripts. And it's absent from many of the ancient translations of the New Testament. So there's a much stronger argument against that particular one. Daniel Wallace, who's a proponent of the, you know, the modern critical text, says no Greek-speaking Christian writer before the year 1215 shows any knowledge of it. I checked up on that. He's wrong. Because... Oregon and Athanasius both alluded to it. And I put there where it was quoted by Cyprian in the third century. So again, even though there are very many, uh, even Byzantine texts that don't have it in, we still have this being quoted. Augustine directly alluded to it, and there's a list of people. In fact, when Jerome put it in the Vulgate, he specifically criticized those who he said had removed it. And I've actually put there in his introduction to one of the Vulgate texts where he talks about much error has occurred at the hands of unfaithful translators. And he says, yeah, omitting mention of the Father, Word, and Spirit. Uh, and he's referring to that specific passage. So Jerome was of the opinion that people had taken it out of certain manuscripts. And that's what I was telling you about. The earliest manuscript, Vaticanus, even though it doesn't have it, it's got those little dots there, which we call umlauts. And they used to place those dots where there was a questionable reading. They just happened to have that at that particular place, that even though they don't contain it, they have those dots there. Initially, Erasmus didn't have it in his Greek New Testament, because he couldn't find any Greek manuscript that included it. And that's why Luther's German translation didn't have it, because he used Erasmus's second edition, which lacked the comma. But he added it in his third edition, because someone was able to give him a Greek manuscript that had it. He was given an additional text that had it. And that's why Tyndall, he used the third edition, included it, 
and it came into the KJV as well because it was in Erasmus's third edition. I just want to point out a lot of people say, well, that shouldn't be there, and it, it, there seems to be a strong case for it. What I found out is that if you actually remove it, it creates a grammatical error in the Greek. It violates gender agreement. If you leave it in, the grammar is perfect. And I just want to explain what gender agreement is. We have something similar in English. If I were to say in English, the man picked up his phone herself, you'd think, well, I'm not a very good English speaker. Okay, because I'm using the man, which is masculine. I'm saying his, which is masculine, and then I'm saying herself. If that wasn't written by John, and it should be left out, then John used bad grammar there. And it's not really consistent with the rest of his writings, because generally, even though his Greek might not have been as good as Luke and Paul, his Greek isn't bad. And that's some kind of mistake you'd expect a child to make. You know, a person who really is not good at the language, where you start getting your, your gender agreement incorrect. So if leaving it out is correct, then John uses bad Greek. So it's not quite clear cut. In fact, that was actually pointed out by a very early Greek-speaking church father, Gregory of Nazianzus. In fact, he had a text that had it out. He wasn't aware of the comma. And he actually says it's strange. He tried to read some significance into it. He said, why is John kind of getting his genders mixed up here? And he thought that John had done it deliberately for some theological reason. Okay, and this is the last one. Not a major difference, but, some, uh, but this is a difference between the Textus Receptus and the majority, not just with the Alexandrian. Uh, Revelation 22, verse 19, it says God will take away his share in the tree of life in the modern versions. The King James Version will say God will take away his part out of the book of life. Now, this is one of the few that I could find that the argument is actually strong because the King James, again, got that from Erasmus. Erasmus, in his Greek text, when he was translated, didn't actually have that verse. He had a text which the last few verses of Revelation were missing. So you know what he did? It was only a couple of verses. He said, well, I'll use my Vulgate. He took his Latin version, how it's rendered in the Vulgate. The Latin version renders it book of life. And you can actually find that the Latin words for book and tree are very similar. So that's not impossible. And it's not a major theological thing, but I think that that's a rare case, you know, where perhaps there is an argument and it's not a big deal. So there is very good arguments that some of those verses that are deleted should be in. So I would say that when you want to do Bible study, if you don't already do it, it's pretty good to have either KJV or NKJV as well. So I like the NIV because it's very readable. It's not always accurate. Sometimes it paraphrases a bit. I like the ESV and the NASB, but I also like particularly the NKJV. KJV is great as well. The language is a bit hard to understand for some people. And they have given the whole thing where you can see in the Latin, the words are very similar. And uh, Erasmus acknowledged that at the end of the apocalypse, he mentions, oh, I, couldn't, I didn't have those verses and I used the Vulgate. Okay, so now let me try to wrap it up. Which is better, the majority or the minority text? Now, I just want to get to some of the crazy theories. You'll get some of these guys who give you conspiracy theories, and they'll say, well, the reason the text was changed was a Catholic conspiracy, satanic ones. And in fact, some of these guys don't even like the New King James. Yeah, I put an excerpt where they say all the modern versions are corrupted, including the New King James version. The corrupted Bible versions are essentially Roman Catholic Bible versions. It's a lot of nonsense. And they destroy the argument, which could be a lot better. Because the Vulgate often supports the readings you find in the King James. And the Westcott Hort and the Nestle Allens, which they're criticizing, are actually produced by Protestant scholars. Whereas the one that the KJV came from, remember, it was translated from a text that was put together by Erasmus. Erasmus was a Catholic. So it's actually the opposite way around. People saying, well, these newer texts are Catholic conspiracies. They were produced by Protestants. And to say, well, the better one is Erasmus. Well, Erasmus was a Catholic. So people need to get their facts straight. In fact, he dedicated the 
uh, text to the Pope, Pope Leo, the very Pope who actually excommunicated Martin Luther. Why do they pick on the Catholics? Because they say, well, Alex the Ex Alexandrian text that caused all this problem is Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. The one was found in a monastery at Sinai and the other was found in the Vatican Library. Well, I want to tell you that that's where you find all these documents because in those days you didn't have a Protestant church. So you're either going to find them in a Catholic monastery or in the Vatican or in Orthodox. You're not going to find them elsewhere because there was no Protestant church. Newsflash. But this is what I believe is fair criticism of the Alexandrian text. Because as I said, some of those differences are quite significant. The problem is they are based primarily on two documents, on Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. And they say those are better because they're older. But antiquity isn't the indication of reliability. And I can't read you this quote now because of time. Oregon was an early church father. He lived in Alexandria. So where this text actually came from. And he lived there in the third century. He said that there were corrupt manuscripts in existence then. And he actually complained about the fact that the copyists were being negligent. He was complaining about texts in Alexandria in the third century. Both Vaticanus and Sinaiticus have evidence of extreme scribal carelessness. Let me just read this to you. This is from the New Westminster Dictionary of the Bible. They say, it should be noticed, however, that there is no prominent biblical manuscript in which there occur such gross cases of misspelling, faulty grammar, and omission, as in Vaticanus. John William Burgeon, who was familiar with the document, said of Sinaiticus that it, the New Testament was extremely unreliable. On many occasions, 10, 20, 30, 40 words are dropped. Letters, words, even whole sentences are free, frequently written twice over or begun and immediately cancelled. He talks about gross blunders in this text, which is the hallmark of the Alexandrian text. When you try to collate the two old documents, the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, he said it is easier to find two consecutive verses in which the two manuscripts differ, the one from the other, than to find two verses that agree. <laughs> now, I might have been exaggerating a bit, but that's what he said. Now, some of the people, again, who don't like the Alexandrian will say, well, you know, Sinaiticus was actually found in the trash at the monastery. Again, it's not entirely true. So you'll have to read the full thing over there. And the guy who found it, did actually find that they were going to throw it out or they're going to burn it. He looked at it, this German scholar, this thing was 1500 years old. So even though it is, you know, maybe not a very good copy, it's very ancient. And they were going to put it in the flames to keep the monks warm. So people will say, well, they were actually going to burn it or whatever it was actually in the trash. And now this is our most authoritative document. Okay. The, the truth is when the monks noticed he was so interested in it, they got suspicious and they gave him some of the, you know, the pages, but that is, he told them, please don't burn it. You can actually read his, his own account there. I don't have time. I've overshot my time, but that was actually his own account where he saw them. It was, you know, probably going to be burned. He told them not to burn it. And ultimately they managed to get it. It was ta taken into Russia. It ended up eventually in um, Britain. You know, when the Soviets were in power, they weren't interested in biblical documents. So they sold it to the, to the UK in the 1930s for 100,000 pounds. Okay, something that was going to be chucked in the trash. Well, burnt, not chucked in the trash. Fair criticism. He has another Alexandrian manuscript that is used a lot, Papyrus 66. It's a near complete codex of the Gospel of John. But it contains on average two errors per verse. Now, you know, how could that happen? Well, the speculation is that the person who copied it didn't know Greek. And so they were literally just looking at it and copying it. And that makes sense because how can you make so many mistakes? Now, Westcott and Hort mainly used Alexandrian readings. A few times they would use the Western text, the uh, Codex Beza. But you know what? They didn't include any Byzantine readings uh, because they said, well, they were later. And they also said that the Byzantine text, in their opinion, was a combination of the Alexandrian and Western text. But we've actually found that that's not true. They made an assumption which has now been proved false. But that bias carried on 
uh, through to Kurt Allen, who was the primary editor of the modern critical text. He considered Greek manuscripts, which are purely or predominantly Byzantine, to be irrelevant for textual criticism. So when they say, well, we consulted all of them and we put it together, they, they dismissed the Byzantine. They only used the Alexandrian. Okay. So if you look at them, this is just the early part, you'll find that in the early centuries, you've got mainly Alexandrian. In Byzantine, even though it's the majority text because of the later documents, in the early days, you don't have too much of them. And that's why these guys say, well, we've got a lot more Alexandrian, it's the earlier one. But what they don't take into account is that the climate in Alexandria and Egypt is a lot kinder to papyrus. So the reason we don't have the original autographs is because the papyrus perishes ultimately. In Alexandria, um, we have a lot more ancient readings because of the climate. So it's not impossible that the Byzantine readings did exist earlier. In fact, it's not only not impossible, it must have been the case because how could we have the church fathers in the second century quoting those readings and yet they weren't in the text? And so that's that next uh, argument in favor of the Byzantine text is that the church fathers who had access to older copies that are older than all those Alexandrian texts often quote, as I've shown you, especially in those disputed readings, they quote in them in the second century. The other argument in favor of the Byzantine is that we know that they went a thousand years after the first ones we found with the manuscript hardly ever changing. So isn't it not that difficult to say, well, we can go back 300 years and they weren't really changed from the originals. How is it that suddenly from, you know, the first ones we find they didn't change for a thousand years and yet we're saying, well, they were adding verses and dropping things out and very careless in the first 300 years and then suddenly Everybody got careful and the things don't change. There's actually a very good track record for the Byzantine text. They're very, very similar to each other. The thing is as well, the Byzantine manuscripts flow from the area in which the earliest church was the strongest as well. None of the apostles wrote from Egypt. Okay, so isn't it more likely that Egypt might have received an abbreviated text. We have Oregon in the third century complaining about their scribes being careless and that some of the documents had been corrupted. And he was a man who consulted all the documents. I'm almost finished, folks. Western non-interpolations. That was a term that Hort coined, where he said that sometimes the Western text, he normally used the Alexandrian one. But in certain cases, the Western text, even though they said they didn't trust it because of all the paraphrase. Every now and then it would have a verse left out. And they would say, well, in those cases, it's more accurate because their idea was shorter is better. So even though the Western text wasn't good enough uh, for their Greek text, when it left a verse out, they said, that's the better rendering. And there was a papyrus 75 that was discovered in the 1950s. And that has blown that theory totally out of the water because it contains text from Luke, which we find are uh, contested passages. In fact, West Cotton Hort left them out. Now, again, they might not make major theological differences, but they have listed them over there. You can see verse 3, verse 6, verse 12, all from Luke 24. They've been left out of West Cotton Hort. And there's the others as well, left out of West Cotton Hort. They are in your newer version. You know why? Because they discovered that papyrus. Now, when they discovered that papyrus, they were surprised to find out that even though it was Alexandrian in flavor, all of those contested passages in that chapter of Luke were in it, this very ancient papyrus. And so all of a sudden, their theory went out of the window, and so Nestle Allen put them back in. Yet they were rejected by West Cotton Hort. If we hadn't discovered papyrus 75, that theory would have continued, and we would have had those verses again, not in the new versions or left out because of their theory, which has turned out to be incorrect. And so my last two slides, which is better, the Byzantine or the Alexandrian text? Okay, I've, I've tried to give you a balanced view. You can see where what my opinion is. I prefer the Byzantine, even though I like a lot of the newer versions, I believe that the, the most of those questionable renderings should be there. Okay, now I'm going to quote Daniel Wallace, who actually favors the minority text. 
the newer one. He's a scholar. But he says, and I'll close with this quotation from him, to argue for the purity of the Byzantine stream, as opposed to the pollution introduced by the Alexandrian manuscripts, is to blow out of proportion what the differences between the two texts really are both in quantity and quality. And so that's why I want to leave this with you, because sometimes people get very unsettled when they read about these you know, differences and they think, oh, can I trust my Bible? You can trust your Bible, because even though there are some of these differences, if you look at the bigger picture, they're actually very few. And so I agree with him, even though I don't favor the Alexandrian text. He says that the majority text differs from the textus receptus, remember? Um, those two I mentioned, the majority text, which is used in the World English Bible, New King James text, the Receptus, the, the, uh, the KJV, he says they agree 99% of the time. He said the majority text differs from the modern uh, critical text in, in only 6,500 places. Now that sounds like a lot, but there's a 98% agreement. But then he points out, he said the vast majority of these differences are so minor that they neither show up in the translation nor affect exegesis. So what he's saying is most of the differences actually don't really, you know, mean anything. Most of them make no difference at all and don't affect doctrine. In fact, I don't know of any church who's gone and changed their statement of faith because of the fact, you know, that they've got the critical text and not the majority text. Because even in cases, as I mentioned, like the, that passage in John, where there's a very good verse on the Trinity that's not there, well, you've got 20 other good verses on the Trinity, so you're not going to destroy the doctrine of the Trinity by taking it out. However, I would recommend, as I mentioned before, add to your arsenal, if you don't have it already, keep an NKJV, or if you don't, or a KJV, because... I believe some of those differences are significant. And as much as I like a lot of the newer versions, I don't buy the argument that the older is better, as I've mentioned why, particularly because of the testimony of the church fathers. But neither am I one of these KJV conspiracists who believe that there were some Catholics actually in a plot 